and he happened to be my gunner. I drove a truck over all in diesel, and I filled up tanks and PCs on Highway 19, Highway 1, and he was my ring gunner. And he always wanted to drive that truck. Well, I, you know, I don't know if I'm supposed to let him do that or not. I mean, he's, if he can, he can. If he can, he can. I don't know. But finally, we would go and fuel these tanks on these bridge sites there from the fire base on 19. And then I come back and I go over to Highway 1. And uh, he wanted to drive. And I told him, I said, now you got to stay on the asphalt as long as you can because at night there would be a commoner, they would set them 50 millimeter of them shell rounds and put and make uh, bombs out of them there and they'd point them towards inside the road. <coughs> and and we'd meet in a, a tank brigade there. They, was, they clear the road every morning, so it's supposed to be safe. And uh, so I said, I'll tell you what, Thomas, his name was Thomas Santel, he's from Moore City, Pennsylvania. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you drive. I said, now, but make sure you stay on the con on the asphalt as long as you can. If you can't, you got to move over, you know, because their tanks are, they're not going to. If they hit uh, one, probably hurt the tanks, but the PCs would probably blow one of the tracks off. But that would be all that would happen. So I was letting him drive, Vernon was meeting this brigade of tanks and we was going we was going north back north and they was coming south and I said Thomas you gotta stay on the stay on the asphalt so I said you need to let me drive. Let me get back and drive. So he he stopped and we got over I got over on the deal and I hadn't went three or four miles. hit a mine and they picked him up in a mail sack and God put this on my heart that he had something for me and and and, 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 he, and he killed uh, Thomas and I've thought about that so much and today it just uh, that God wanted to write his testimony and say, you know, he had something for me. And and at the time I didn't think about that. I wasn't I've been raised up in church and and I mean I, I knew what to do, I just wasn't doing it. But anyway, I think about him and his family, you know, and God spared me and took him, so I, I just praise God for what he's done in my life the last 15 years, and just thank you, Jesus. Amen. Maybe you're sitting out there in a congregation, and you you heard what uh, Brother Sandy said. Maybe it's because from some of you, maybe God has spared you amen. or something. Yes, amen. Maybe, maybe the enemy had you Mark, and God said, no, I have something to do, and you've been spared. I think many of us can share testimonies in different ways, whether it's through war or maybe through lifestyles that, that we've been subject to in our lives. God has spared us. I know for myself, God has spared me many times, and I give him praise for that because he has a purpose. And every one of you have a purpose. Yes, yeah. You know, you can't you can't run from it. It will catch you <laughs> sooner or later. Uh, nothing you can do about it. All right. Uh, I think the, the sooner you yield to it, the better off you are. And maybe those that you were destined to touch will be all the better. Now, Julio, I'm not going to ask you to come up, but I understood that you witnessed today or you this week. This week? All right. Yeah. <laughs> we put everybody on the spot. <laughs> I'm a big guy, but I'm kind of shy. So. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, uh, my, my wife was having lunch for me every day. And I go to work. And 
uh, God put in my heart that I needed to go out and grab something to eat. And I'm like, well, God, I got a lunch. What, what do you want me to go out for? So I, I listen. And I'm headed to the closest place, Jack in the Box. And he said, no, I'm not here. Burger King, no, not here. Taco Bell, it's cheap. No. <laughs> then I see Chicken Express, and he told me this morning I'm going to stop. And I said, okay, bro. I like chicken, so I'll go there. Right there. <laughs> but as I ordered and I started filling out my drink, he spoke to me in my heart very strong. And I turned it out, and I see this person sitting there by himself, and I uh, told me he needed to go talk to him. And I went to him and I said, uh, would you mind if I sit here with you? Uh, that way we don't need a loan and we can talk, you know. So we started talking about family. And then he made a, uh, he started talking to me and he said something that the Lord said, this is where you're going. And talked to him about me. So I started doing that. I, I gave him the plan of salvation and, and how much God loves him. And he kept saying, well, I'm a good guy. My wife's never seen me do this, never seen me do that. And I said, even, even the most, you know, even if we don't do a, a thing, a bad thing to others or whatever, we still need God in our lives. Amen. And uh, he said, you're a Christian, right? And I said, yes. He said, well, I'm Catholic, but I love everything you've been telling me, and, and, and I'll, I'll do my best to go and, and we see more of what you're telling me. When I told my wife about this, uh, she's like, honey, that's not you. Uh, you don't do that. You're very private. You're... <laughs> Bro, it's not me. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. You know? <laughs> and uh, I, I'm overwhelmed with God's love and my prayers lately have been, God, I don't want riches. I, I, don't, I don't want material stuff. I like this. I got, I, I want your perfect love in my life. Yes. Because I want to love my neighbor as much as he has loved us. Yes. And it's such a big love that I feel in my heart. It, it really overtakes my body. It really overruns me. And I don't want people to go to hell, to go without knowing him. And I've been putting it in my life, in my mind, I've been setting that in my mind that I need to talk to whoever I see, even if I don't know them, make some kind of excuse, whatever, to jump in and, and do what you have to do. Yes, I talk to everybody at work. God told me because I was a metal, heavy metal listener, and he told me to stop that garbage. <laughs> and uh, he said, I dare you to put my music, put Christian music, and I'm going to bless this place. And at first I didn't understand it because they started letting go of people when I started doing that. And I'm like, God, you said you were going to bless this place. What's going on? But he was giving me like more privacy and more, more people to be a little bit more separated than others. And... All you hear there, there's some, a couple guys that still listen to the music, but it's like Christian music, it's full blast in there, and nobody tells me nothing. <laughs> and uh, I talk to people about Christ, and God is working in their lives, and God, one of the guys that I talked to this week, he gave his life to Christ, and that, that was so good. <laughs> There's power in our testimony, you know that? And we, we fail to realize that because not only does it affect other people, but the more we hear what God is doing within us, the more it builds our faith and it builds us up because we realize God is using us and working through us to touch those around about us. And that's really important because the enemy is always there to try to make you feel less. And God's always there to lift you up and build you up. Amen? Uh, we're excited about what God is doing. And uh, we're going to move forward into the Word. Thank you, praise team. Do you want to say you're released? <laughs> Don't go far. Nancy, <laughs> come in my Bible, please.
This morning, we want to continue uh, talking about the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God in our life, very, there's very little that we can accomplish. And so oftentimes, as believers, we've come to a relationship with God. We've received Him in our heart as our Lord and Savior. And we feel like, well, I've done what I'm supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, we, we get hit with different things and different situations. And if we're not careful, we allow the enemy to convince us that we have no power to overcome it. It is what it is, and we just got to accept it as part of our life. But I'm here to share with you this morning that you don't have to accept anything of the enemy. You, you have the power and the ability within you to overcome the enemy. And as a matter of fact, you have the power to put him uh, to flight. Scripture says that if you resist the enemy, that he'll flee from you. But there's a key there. You have to resist him. And if you resist him, then he will ultimately flee from you. And you have to be the one that's willing to do it. In the, in the Word of God, I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Luke. And we're going to look at chapter number 11 just for a moment this morning as we, as we move forward. I remember as a young boy uh, praying to receive the Holy Spirit into my life. And uh, most of you know uh, the Pentecostal background that I came out of. Uh, believe very strongly in the power of the Holy Spirit. To believe in the, the healing power of Jesus. And believe in the manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as a young boy, I, I saw them operated a lot. Uh, in my own family, I saw God move many, many times and in many ways. I've shared the story with you when my dad was dying with crippling arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. The doctor said that he would be dead within a short time. And my dad prayed and uh, just spoke to the Lord and said, uh, Lord, you made a declaration that in three days if they tore your temple down, uh, that you would uh, rebuild it within three days. And, uh, of course, he was talking about the resurrection of his body. And he said, uh, I make a declaration today that no matter what the doctors have said in three days, uh, he was bedfast. I'll be out of bed, and I'll be standing at the window, and I'm going to give praise and glory to you for my healing. Three days later, my dad was standing at the window giving glory and praise unto God. And I, I watched that healing power of God all through my life, God being made manifest in so many different ways. Uh, even when we were in the burn units at Parkland uh, serving as a chaplain, we had several situations to where uh, there was no hope whatsoever. And even though sometimes even the family had no hope, the doctors had no hope, uh, they believed death was imminent. Uh, God would just enable us to stand in faith believing and we would see a miracle happen and we would see them go home uh, being touched and healed by the power of God. Some of you have experienced miracles in your life. You've seen those that the doctor would simply say absolutely there's just no way in the world and yet something on the inside of you, you don't understand it all the time, but something on the inside of you said no, They'll live and not die. Yes. And you may have made that expression. I remember one time when I told the doctor that uh, over a friend of mine that was dying, and they gave him absolutely no hope whatsoever. They had literally ripped him open and to massage his heart to keep him alive. And I told the doctors, I said, no, the Lord told me to tell you that he'll live and not die. Of course, you know how they looked at me, right? <laughs> you know, like you know, you're a preacher, stay in the pulpit and let us do our job. But sometimes there's something on the inside of you and you really can't explain it all the time, but there's just something that resonates on the inside of you and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has this in control. And that doesn't come from up here, okay? It comes from in here. It comes from in our inner man and in our spirit. And if you have your Bible in uh, Luke, uh, we want to look at chapter 11, verse number uh, 11. 
and we'll start there. Let's start at verse number 9 and get it in more context. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. I want to pause there just for a moment because I'm going to sidestep my notes, okay? Because there, there is something that's really powerful in that particular verse. Now listen to it again. And so I say unto you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. For every one, say every one. Every one. Say every one is me. Every one is me. All right? So what's it saying? For everyone who asks, he does what? He receives. So that means you and me. When we ask, God has given us a promise that when we ask of Him, we will receive. Now, sometimes I may have to wait on receiving that because God may look at my life and say, Paul, I know what's best for you. And right now, I'm going to answer your prayer. How many of you know your prayers are answered the moment they leave your lips? Amen. Now, some of you didn't agree with me. There. How many of you know that when you pray and your prayer leaves your lips, it's answered? You say, well, how do you know that? Isaiah says that God hears our prayers the moment that we speak them, and he sees our tears even before we start asking him for something in our life. So we know that we're going to receive whatever we are asking or seeking for. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks does what? He finds. And to him who knocks, it will what? It will be open. Isn't it amazing that when God makes a statement to us, he goes on and lets you know what's going to happen with that statement? He says, if you seek, you will find. So he says, yes, you will find. Knock, and it'll be open. Yes, if you knock, it will be open unto you. Have you ever had a situation in your life that you needed an answer from God and you need to see some kind of clarity? Maybe not the full picture yet, but if there was just a crack in the doorway, if there was just a glimmer of light for that which you're asking for, how many of you realize that builds your faith up, amen? And that helps you realize the fullness of what God is going to bring to me is just literally right around the corner. Jesus wants you and I to know that any time that we seek, any time we ask, any time we knock, those things are going to be done unto you and I. God's going to answer His well, he's basically going to answer our prayer, and he's going to be faithful to his word for you and I. Let's go a little bit further. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by a son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish. Now he's asking a question, so I'm going to ask the same question. Will he? Yeah. That's a question. <laughs> if I, if your son or your child comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, I'd like to have a fish, and you look at the son or the daughter and say, Well, you know what? I'm not going to give you a fish. I'm going to give you a snake. How many here would give them a snake? <laughs> oh, we wouldn't give him a snake, would we? Or her a snake. I, or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? No. These are absolute questions that we know the answer to. And they almost seem absurd. You know where I'm going now, don't you? They almost seem absurd. Let's look at the latter one. He'll not give him a scorpion. Verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give 
the Holy Spirit to those who ask of Him. Now that's very simple. Earthly Father knows that if your children is hungry, you're not going to give them a venomous snake. You're not going to give them a, a scorpion. One of the other versions says that if he asks for bread, you would not give him a rock. All right? So if we know how to give the right gifts and the right things unto our children, how much more then does our Heavenly Father know how to give the good gifts unto you? And what does he refer to there? He says, how much will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. God knows how to give you exactly what you have need of. Now I need the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit at work in my life. Why? Because He leads me, He guides me, He teaches me all truth, He shows me everything that is yet to come, He empowers me, He equips me with the giftings that I might be able to demonstrate the love of God into this world, into man's life, through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit is not for me in order to wear a name tag or to go around and say, wow, look what God is using me for, but rather those gifts is to help you profit and help everybody profit with all. Can I hear you say amen? Because that's what they're for. They're for us to be able to demonstrate God's love unto individuals who need to see God's love being made manifest. So God gives us these giftings in our life that we can make changes and see changes in the lives of other people around about us. We've got to understand. People ask me a lot of times. They say, Paul, how can you see so many miracles overseas and so oftentimes not see miracles here in the States? Well, first of all, I want you to realize there are more miracles going on in the States than what you think there are. There are people being healed of cancer. There are people being raised from the dead. There are blind eyes opening. There are limbs that are being changed. Everything God is doing the same today here as He's done around the world and the same here as what He's done in times past today. But most of the time, we don't notice it. We don't see it. Overseas, there seems to be a greater desperation sometimes. And because there's a greater desperation, we see it happen more often. But there's another key to it. And this is the key I want to help you get a hold of. When you and I speak of the power of the Holy Spirit, always understand, John says that the Holy Spirit will testify of Christ Jesus. Now one of the biggest, uh, I guess I could say a judgment that comes against many times spirit-filled, charismatic, Pentecostals, or, or those that believe that the gifts have not stopped, that they're still functioning in the church today, one of the criticism is that we always speak of the tongues or we always speak of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we don't talk about Jesus as much. No, let me tell you the true fact. When the power of the Trinity and the, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, comes into your life, you immediately begin to testify of the goodness and the glory and of the power and the majesty of Jesus Christ because had Christ not said, had said what He said, it's expedient for you to go because if I go, I'll send the Comforter there and when the Comforter there, He'll abide with you forever on the inside of you forever so the very fact that we receive the holy spirit and we give the utterance unto him lets us know that we're testifying of the goodness and of the mercy and of the grace of jesus christ so it's not legitimate criticism except for maybe of those who are not lining up with what the word of god says now, you remember last week our text verse that was found in John 7, verse 37 and 38, 9. On the last days of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. 
But this he spake concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. Now it's amazing in the Word of God how oftentimes Christ is referring to the Holy Spirit. And when he refers to the Holy Spirit, he is referring to something that is at work on the inside of you and me. It's not something that is apart from us. It's not a metaphor. It's, it's not just a lightning or a fire or a river or, or a stream or oil. But it is a real person of the Trinity that is inside of you and I that's living in us, working in us, and manifesting the goodness and the glory of God to a world that is hungry after more than what this earth is offering them. But Jesus says it's out of you that these rivers are going to flow. Well, I wish I had more rivers on the inside of me. Then I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 11. Ask. Seek. No. And the fullness of God will begin to flow out of you. You know how many times people come to me and say, Pastor Paul, I just wish God would show me my, what my gifting is. I've been sitting in church for 10 years and I still don't know what my gift is. Well, then why have you just been sitting for 10 years? Why haven't you been knocking? Why haven't you been seeking? Why haven't you been asking God? God, what is it that you want me to do? Lord, what is that gifting that's in my heart and in my life? And I'm going to make it very simple for you. What is it that you believe God has called you to do that if you don't do it, it ain't ever going to get done? If you can answer that question, then you'll have a good idea of how God may want to be using you. Right. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> you ask God. God, what is it that you would have me to do? God spoke to me and told me what I was to do, and I've been doing it. And I will continue to do it until my time to go on to my reward comes. But I had a seeking for it. I had an asking for it. I had an idea on the inside of me of what God wanted me to do. Would you believe that there was a time that I would run out the door before I would ever get up on a platform and talk? There was time I'd be scared to death to get in front of people. There were times when the enemy convinced me that I didn't have enough sense to, to come in out of the rain, okay? But for whatever reason, God said, this is what I want to use you for. And he did so. In John 20, verses 21 through 22, Then said Jesus unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Again, Jesus referring to that third person of the Trinity that was to be upon you and be in you and you would go forth to do what he's called you to do. Now I shared with you last week and I'll touch on it just for a moment here and then we'll go on. When Jesus breathed on them, they received the impartation of the Holy Spirit on the inside of them and what happened to them that day is basically they had a new conversion and they had surrendered their life unto God. God breathed on them. He breathed life on the inside of them. And that is the key because the Holy Spirit, the terminology, is, it is the breath of God. It is the breath of God that moved upon the face of the earth and caused everything to be. It was the breath of God that came on the outside of the tabernacle. It was the breath of God that came on the day of Pentecost. Cost. And here it was God's breath that breathed life into them. And he said, now go to Jerusalem and stay there until you be endued with power from up on high, right. after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Yes, that's right. Now wait a minute. Pastor Jeff, is this a contradiction? Nope. He breathed on them. They received that breath of life. How many of you realize that when you came to Jesus Christ and you asked Him to be Lord and and Savior of your life, how many of you would agree that through the power of the Spirit of Almighty God that drew you unto God, breathed life into you, and you no longer are dead, but now you're alive in Christ Jesus. Amen? The life was breathed on the inside of you. I 
says, I want you to go and I want you to tarry because more is getting ready to happen to you. Because now life is on the inside of you. But it's not just good enough to have life on the inside of you if you just let it stay there. Amen. I remember years ago, Nancy and I were in an area in Mindanao, and uh, we were in Cagayan de Oro, and there were not very many missionaries going to Cagayan de Oro at that particular time. We were one of the few that was going there. And after we had been there four or five years, back and forth, I'd go about twice every year, and after we had been there for a period of time, all of a sudden now missionaries started coming in from Korea. Missionaries were coming in from Australia. Missionaries were coming in from Taiwan. Uh, more American missionaries were coming in. And before you know it, there were all kinds of crusades going on. I took that as my cue to go someplace else, all right? Because I knew that we had laid the groundwork that needed to be laid, and God was blessing that groundwork, and now more ministries were coming in. But I remember a word that God told me, and we had about three or four hundred of the pastors together at that time, and I said, listen, this is what God showed me in a vision. He showed me an incredible lake, and this lake was huge. And this lake was teeming with all kinds of fish and life. And I saw different tributaries or different streams running in to this lake. But what I didn't see was anything running out of the lake. And I told them, I said, I want you to hear what God's Word is saying to you. God's Word is saying that He has enlarged the lake. And he is bringing unto you a lot of ministries and a lot of opportunities to hear the word of God. But if you do not take that word and do something with that word and allow it to flow out from your city, it will stagnate and whatever life is in there will die and you will find yourself down in the future dead, dried up. Because you did not let it flow out from you. The reason that the Holy Spirit is in your life is to give you life. And that life cannot be shut up. That life cannot be put behind a dam. Jesus said, out of you shall flow rivers of living waters. Amen? So that breath of the Holy Spirit, that life that comes in you, has got to come out of you, and it's got to flow to those around about you. And part of that life is the giftings that God has equipped you with. Part of that life is bringing life to others that are dying from sickness. Part of that life is you being able to uh, speak the words of wisdom and knowledge uh, into somebody's life that can change a course of a life that is heading for destruction or someone who is being overtaken by depression and they don't want to live any longer. You've got life inside of you, the very breath of God, and that's got to begin to come out from us or else we're not doing any good in this world, all right? We're just coming here playing church on Sunday morning, all right? But if we've got life in in us and we're letting life flow out of us, we're changing the world in which we live in. Amen. That's one of the reasons you have the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not just for us to run around and speak in tongues and shout and dance and have a great time, although I love doing that. We're going to sing that song uh, about running and I'm going to start taking off and running one of these days. Yeah. Have a great time in the Lord. The pastor we sat under while we were working on the mission fields, David Ellis, a little bit short. I mean, hope you ain't watching this, David. He's real short. <laughs> All right. Real short guy. And uh, real, real thin. You know, one of them guys that you go like, wow. I was like that when I was about 12. <laughs> Maybe. All right. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit would hit him, and he'd just go taking off all over that place. He'd run back and forth across the platform about 20 times, and it seemed like in three or four seconds. <laughs> but something has to happen. Life on the inside of us must begin to be radiated out from us if we're really to make a difference in the world in which we live in. And I know what God is trying to equip us to do. So this 
receiving of the Holy Spirit, we receive life on the inside of us. And then it's that on the inside. And I know there's different terminologies, and we can really get sometimes, well, I'm just going to say it. Sometimes our singing, our songs are not completely theologically correct. All right? And what I mean by that, we've learned how to just, you know, make courses and sing songs. Sometimes we have to stop and look at some of the words, all right, and go like, whoa, wait a minute, I don't know about that. But let me give you an example. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you? Yes. Amen? Is that scriptural? <clears throat> you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, filled is a terminology that Paul used, meaning a continuous filling. Doesn't mean that you came up here and, and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you spoke in tongues 35 years ago and you've never done anything since then. Well, yeah, you got filled, but you might want to check your bucket, all right? Uh, because there's a, a, a total filling and a refilling, a constant infilling of God's presence into our life. Why? Because the more you give out, the more you got to get put on the inside of you, okay? And that's why sometimes preachers want to go to conferences all the time. And I have no problem with that. We've got to go sometimes and get filled back up because a lot of it comes out of us and you can get kind of weary sometimes. So you, you want to get filled up. But I don't got to go to five conferences for every one sermon that I preach, all right? Uh, so we can overdo it on the other end of the fence, okay? But here's what I'm trying to tell you is that God wants you to know that you have more inside of you. So it's on the inside of us. His power and His presence resides in us. And we've got to learn how to let that go. So sometimes we sing the song, Holy Spirit, fall on me. All right? Well, I understand what that means. Okay? On the day of Pentecost, they were all in the upper room, and they were gathered, and there was a great mighty wind that came in, and that wind came down, went right in, it went. And they all began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you understand that you and I now are born-again believers, all right? All right? If you're not, you should be, all right, before the day is over with. Can you say amen? amen. Even if you don't believe, you need to say amen, all right? All right? So, the Spirit's on the inside of us. And how often times do we keep asking the Holy Spirit to fall on us? Did you find, did you hear what I said? Wow. <laughs> All right, Holy Spirit, fall on me. Holy Spirit, fall on me. Holy Spirit, fall on me. And I wonder sometimes if God's not looking over the banister rails of, of heaven and going like, listen, it fell 2,000 years ago. It's on the inside of you. Let it flow out of you because you have rivers of living waters on the inside of you. Let it come out. Let it touch everywhere that you go. Because the Bible says everywhere that the Spirit went, water, everywhere it went according to Ezekiel, anything that was dead came alive. Woo! Hallelujah! So, if you're working in a place and they're dead, then let the Holy Spirit flow and bring life unto that. If you're dealing with people that, that are spiritually dead and are trying to drag you down, let the Holy Spirit flow out of you. Bring life back into them. Speak life into them because the power of the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. Amen. We often say we know that the presence of God is going to be here. Presence is a term for the Holy Spirit. We know the presence of God is going to be here. Well, how do you know that? Well, I brought him with me. <laughs> well, if you brought him with you, why are you asking it to fall down upon top of you? Amen. Come on. It's on you. It's in Come on. you. Come on. We've got to learn how to release that which we have. Yes. Right. Because we have all the stuff in the world. You ever watch different types of movies and things like that and someone will be wanting to give an envelope to somebody and, and you know, they offer it to them and they grab it and then they're, they're trying to pull it back, you know, like this, like, I don't know if I really want to give that to you or not. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's how we can be. Yeah. See, people can be pulling on us that life wow. that's on the inside of us. Wow. And they need it. Now I'm going to say something here and I hope you understand what I'm going to say. 
Just as you and I are knocking and seeking and asking God for needs and prayers to be answered in our lives, situations to be changed, do you know that there are people who are asking, knocking, and seeking, except they don't know any other door except you? They don't know any other door. Exactly. You're the only avenue that they know. You're the only access that they know of. Because you hear people say something like that. Listen, I'm really sick in my body, but I know if I can get to Danny, Danny has faith in healing. Danny believes in healing, all right? Danny will, will pray for you the last time you're going under, and he'll believe you're going to come up with you know bubbles and wings and all kinds of stuff. He <laughs> believes that. How many people are knocking on your door? How many people are knocking on our door? And they're seeking and they're asking and they're trying to find an answer to the needs that they have in their life. They don't know where else to go. They have no place else to turn to. They turn to relatives and many times the relatives can be the biggest naysayers on the face of the planet, all right? And they can just really push you down big time and you don't know where to go. They're coming to you and me. And you and I have a reservoir on the inside of us that has healing and deliverance and power and glory and everything that they have need of. And it's on the inside of you. And we'll say, well, you need to find a good church somewhere and that'll answer your problems. Well, I've got news for you. You are that good church. You are that church. You are that, that hope. You are that reservoir of life. That's right. Amen. And if they can find you, they can find life. Amen. That's right. Christ Jesus that's in your life. That's right. You can't save them, obviously. But they can find life through you. That's right. Because you're the one who has the answer Amen. and the hope. So we, we look at some more of the scriptures. When we are born again of the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. We are further empowered when we receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit and we should continue to receive the impartation of the Spirit's power throughout our Christian journey. It should never, ever stop. Now, if you are a great musician, now Joyce, how long have you been playing? Since, I was 12. Since you were 12. You played piano since you were six. Nobody do the math. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They can do the math. Joyce just turned 80. So we're talking about 74 years. Now, when, when did you come to a place to where everybody came to you and said, Joyce, you are really an incredible violin player, a violinist? How old were you? About 12. <laughs> I'm glad she's not honest. <laughs> All right, about 12. Now, let me ask you another. Okay, six years old, she's learning. 12 years old, people are saying, you're really good. All right, you're great. All right? Now, have you ever stopped practicing? No. Amen. Did you, did you hear what I said? You're still practicing. Right. Well, 60 years ago, they said she was great. Now, what would have happened? What do you think would have happened 60 years ago if you set your violin down and you never played another stroke? It would have just been dormant. It would have been dormant. Right. Amen. Yeah. Right. Amen. Oh, are you hearing where I'm at? Yeah. That is the same way about the power of the Spirit of God that's working in our lives. Yes, yeah. exactly. If we exercise that Spirit on the inside of us, we're going to see results. But if we simply say, well, hey, you know what? I, you know, like I used to tease you about, you know, the testimony when I was a kid. I'm saved. I, I'm so glad I'm saved, sanctified, and petrified. All right? You know, just that's it. I got it all. I'm, I'm, I'm set now, okay? 
and then they would always add on, I'm a member of the great church of God, all right? Well, that, that's okay, too. It ain't going to do you better good if you're petrified, all right? You're not going to be able to flow out and reach out until you break up some of the things that hinder you on the inside. So it's a continuation of us growing in the Lord. There's no stopping point. There's no stopping point. I've been preaching for uh, 52 years now as pastor. That's a long time. Well, what if I would have said 25 years ago, well, I've got, hey, after 25 years of preaching, man, I, and I do, you can look in my files, I've got a stack of written sermons like this, literally like that. I've got tons of them there that I have preached over all these years. So what if 15 or 20 years ago I simply said, you know what? I don't even have to open my Bible anymore. I don't have to study anymore. I don't have to pray anymore. I'll just bring out some of these old sermons and we can go through them again. And man, I'm good for... I had a pastor tell me one time, he said after two years in his church, he asked the bishop to move him because he went through his sermon notes. Well, that's pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah. But if I had never done this, all right, and that's all I relied on. I promise you, there'd only be two or three in the pews. You would find someplace else to go. Why? Because you don't want yesterday's manna. You want what God's telling us right now for our church right now and for your life right now. Well, isn't that the same way with the Holy Spirit? People are hungry and they want truth and they want something that's real and we've got to keep bringing in so we can keep giving out. So we have to constantly do that. We can't become satisfied. If we do, we will stagnate. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, he said, but the manifestation, or to make visible, of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, which simply means everyone. It is clear from God's Word that our expression of our language on that day of Pentecost, or when the Holy Spirit came upon us, would not be understood by everybody. Now, it doesn't always happen different ways, and, and my time is not going to allow me to do what I want to do today, because I've just got too much on my heart. And I'm going to try to find something here that will help explain it. On that day of Pentecost, something took place. They received an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They spoke with a language that they absolutely had no knowledge of, didn't understand what that was. But God in His own wisdom wanted to be glorified and magnified. And He spoke unto other men through that language. Now here's what I want you to understand, and I've pointed this out before, but I believe it cannot be pointed out enough. The scripture says that out of that upper room there came a sound. Now, I don't know exactly what that sound was. But there was a sound. And who can give me a key of G? Give me a key of G. <laughs> uh, is that close enough? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, that's a sound. Joyce, give me a sound. All right, there's a sound. Jeff, give me a sound. You... <laughs> you know I had to do that. Yeah. Uh, there you go. There was a sound that came out of that room. Yeah, for you folks, I, love, I, I just love preaching. Okay? I love the Word of God. I love ministry. There was a sound. Now, everyone that was there, 16 different nations that were there, they heard that sound, except they heard that sound in their language. All right. So now, those of you that listened, especially to Jeff, some of you, some of you may have heard a sharp, some of you may have heard a flat, or some of you just may have heard Dead. <laughs> Somewhere in between there, all right? But you heard a sound according to your ear, okay? And it was the same sound, okay? But we all hear things differently. 
16 different nations were there and they heard a sound. But the sound that they heard was in their own language. But it testified of the goodness and of the glory of Jesus Christ. So everybody heard the message of Christ that day through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible tells us, and I'm going to have to break this down into a couple parts, otherwise we'll miss some true parts in here. The Bible says that in James, that the Holy Spirit builds us up and edifies. Paul tells us we speak in a language, and there's two languages that I just want to talk about for a moment. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit that comes into our life, that we speak in other tongues, that is, we call it a prayer language. We call it a devotional language. Uh, we call it an intercessory language. And we call it a language that can edify us and build us up in the faith. Now, how many of you know that we all need that to be built up in the faith? That is a language that you speak unto God. That's, that's between you and God, okay? And you exercise that language. There were several that received their language prayer language last week, and I encourage you to utilize it all the time. Because the more you utilize it, the more it becomes natural for you. And that is a prayer language between you and God. Alright? Then there's a prayer language, there's a, a, a tongue that is from us to man. Alright? That's the gift of tongues. And that's the tongues that Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 12. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that gift is only to be used when you can interpret that gift or someone in the congregation has a gift of interpretation because God is wanting to speak to the house and He's wanting to speak to us and we need to know what God is saying, alright? So it's interpreted in order that we can understand what God is saying to the house. Now where the confusion comes in is when people say, well... Not everybody will have that gift. No, they won't. But everybody can have that utterance. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay? Yes. And that utterance is building you up in the faith. Yes. That utterance is for you to communicate with God. Yes. That utterance is for you to do warfare. Alright? That's between you and God. You're, you're doing a warfare. You're doing a battle. You're, you're, you're beginning to minister through the power of the Spirit. You're building yourself up in the faith. But then there comes a time in the church when there's a gift of that tongue. And that gift of that tongue is when God's wanting to say, Thus saith the Lord unto you. You say, well, how do you bear that out? Because the Scripture simply says that a tongue, when it's interpreted, equals prophecy. Prophecy is a speaking of thus saith the Lord to the body of Christ. Amen. So we know that there are two different parts. But I want to share a story with you just for a moment. Um, and it's amazing how God does what he does. And let me get this here. Because I, I, I want to get it right. All right. This gift that God wants to use, what I call the gift of, of tongues. I'm not talking about the prayer language, I'm talking about the gift. A typical example is that what happened to a well-known American evangelist by the name of Tommy Hicks. While he was preaching in a Russian town in Rostov, he was being assisted by a Russian interpreter. And about halfway through the message, the woman began to become very angry. She refused to interpret any further the testimony of Hicks and about the miracles that he had witnessed. She spat in his face and she left him saying, I will not interpret such nonsense. Tommy wiped his face of the spit and in this seemingly hopeless situation, he looked to the Lord for help. In faith, he began to build himself up with his prayer language. Now, I don't know how he would have done it but for me personally, I would have probably just said, okay, Lord, I really got to have help, all right? And I would have probably turned my back on everyone for a moment, and I'd have begun to exercise the Holy Spirit in me, and I'd have been to begin to build myself up in the faith, and I'd begin to try to listen to what the Holy Spirit had. After he had done that, something began to happen. He noticed that the audience seemed to be able to understand everything he was saying. 
although he did not understand a word of it himself. He was speaking in Russian. And the Holy Spirit moved among the crowd, and many gave their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read one more. This came out of the Chinese Christian today. Heart-stirring news from behind the bamboo curtain. This has truly happened. <clears throat> A group of young, kids, young Christians of the grammar school, grammar school, we're not talking about seasoned preachers. We're talking about grammar school. In Shanghai, were on their way to the interior. And in the mountains, they were going to visit a live, unreached tribe, which spoke an entirely different dialect. At last, they arrived. In one of the villages, they began to visit the people. And barely hard with broken sentences, they were trying to talk to them. The people, however, didn't trust them. They thought that they were agents of the communist government sent to spy on the villagers. Because of the broken dialects of the students, they were not able to express themselves. Whereupon the villagers decided to do away with them. Do away with them. They marched them out of the village and led them to a huge tree. They put ropes around their neck. And the moment that they were going to be hanged, in a last minute effort, one of the students tried to explain himself to the people and he was able to help them understand that basically before you kill us, can I have a moment of prayer? The villagers allowed this and the student knelt down with ropes still around their neck and they began to pray. They lifted up their hands to heaven and they cried out to God to deliver them. And while they were still in prayer, one of the students began to pray in tongues. He fluently spoke the language of that particular village. All the inhabitants gathered around them. What did this young man speak about? He spoke about the love of God, about the wondrous works of Jesus, about the desire to visit this particular village, and about their love for them. And all of the villagers were deeply moved and very much ashamed. And they said, this group of young people came to visit us, and we wanted to kill them. The students were taken back to the village. A feast was prepared in their honor, which ended up to have a gospel meeting, and the majority of the village was converted and to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. on the inside of you raging to be released. Waiting to be just break forth out of you. And I have all kinds of documentations of hundreds of examples. You cannot limit God. You can't say, God, you can't do this anymore. I won't let you do it anymore. Don't you know that it stopped 2,000 years ago with the death of the last apostle. And you know what God's probably saying? I don't care what you think. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Amen. It don't make any difference to me what you think. Amen. If I want to heal somebody, I'm going to heal them. If I'm going to change their life, I'm going to change their life. If I want to use an unknown language through them to reach a village or, or a whole nation, I'll do that. I'll do what I want to. I'm God. I'm going to do it. Yes. Powerful examples yes. of what God wants to do for you. I'll close well. It's only 12 o'clock. Shoot that clock. That's <laughs> all.
If we focus only on ourselves, listen, we are going to be miserable. Yes. All right? Look, the whole world, you're not thin enough, you're not fat enough, you're not tall enough, you're not short enough, <laughs> you're not wealthy enough, you're not poor enough. It's all, everything is out there. And if we listen to the world, we're tossed about. Listen, I love coffee. I absolutely love coffee. Amen. You know how many times over all the years that I've been drinking coffee, I've been told it's good for you, it's going to help you, it will alert your mind, two weeks later it's going to kill you, you're going to die, you're going to die up, a month later, man, you need to have five cups a day at least to get started on. Listen, stop listening to the world. Listen to the voice of the Spirit on the inside of you. And be moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And you'll change lives. <laughs> Tell you what, this world had you running ragged. <laughs> you turned the clock off, didn't you? God's good, isn't he? Yes, he is. I'm going to ask the praise team to come if they would. I want to give us just an opportunity just to talk to the Lord for a moment in our life. Several of you received the Holy Spirit last week, the impartation of that. And I just encourage you to keep speaking your language, use your language, pray in your language. Now, again, I'm going to get ready to say something that I don't want you to misunderstand me, but I, I want you to make sure I make it clear. Everything we do, we start in the flesh. Yeah. Listen to what I'm going to say. I'm going to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. But your flesh has to either get up out of your seat and open your mouth. Yeah. Raise your hands. Flesh. And the moment you begin to do that, you begin to release yourself to the Spirit of God. And the Spirit begins to come in and take over. But it's always us. We've got to make the move to do it. I can't heal people, but I can make a move to stretch my hand toward them and pray. Now that's that's my flesh. I fully believe and I'm expecting God to move. Because He's got to do the work. He'll give the utterance. You just got to open your mouth.
Gotta believe God. Someone said, Well, I'm not feeling good. Lay hands on them and pray for them to be healed. Well, when they get to church, well, well, why wait till they get to church? It's miserable until they get there. Pray for them before they get to church, and then they'll be healed in Jesus' name. So, whatever it is today that you need, well, we're worshiping the Lord. Just bow your hands and ask the Lord, Lord, I want more. I want more. You know what that more is that you're asking God for. You know what that more is that you're seeking. And you want more wisdom, more knowledge, more discernment, more understanding, a greater depth of His Word. Whatever it is, you may want to see God be manifest through your life in healing and deliverance. Whatever it is, ask Him. Just ask Him today. God, this is what I'm asking you for. And then be bold enough to just look up to heaven and say, Lord, I receive it today in Jesus' name. If you do that, I want you to 